Well, good morning and welcome to Meadowbrook. We are so glad that you're here, whether you are joining us in person or online this morning. My name is John Miller. I'm a member of Meadowbrook uh, Church. My family and I have been attending here since about 2011, and we absolutely love having Meadowbrook as our church home. This morning, we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Romans, but this morning we come to a very important part of this book. Most scholars would agree that Romans chapter 8 is sort of the pinnacle of the book of Romans, and it all kind of comes to a peak in the verses we will be reading today. In fact, one very famous commentator said that Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter ever written by anyone about anything in all of human history, which I thought was quite an endorsement. And this morning, my hope is that we would just begin to get a glimpse of what it is that so many people have found so important and significant for our lives in these verses. Largely what Paul's going to be talking about is the idea that we live in a world that is full of pain and suffering. Now we probably didn't need Paul to tell us that. All we need to do is turn on the news and we can see the evidence of it in the world all around us. We are surrounded by brokenness. Broken hearts, broken relationships, broken friendships, broken marriages, broken promises, broken homes, broken contracts. And very often, all of this brokenness leads to pain, sometimes even tragic pain in our lives. But truly, the greatest tragedy of it all is that so many people have absolutely no idea why. They don't know why. And so we go through life somewhat bewildered, and confused, maybe even angry over the pain that we are experiencing. But in the verses we're going to be reading this morning, Paul tells us exactly why. If you have your Bibles with you, I would encourage you to open them up to Romans chapter 8. You're not going to want to miss what Paul has to say this morning. Romans chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible for you, like she mentioned, there should be some available for you in the pew racks. And in those pew Bibles, Romans chapter 8 is on page one thousand. 133. The words will also be on the screen behind me. And if you're joining us online this morning, the words will also appear on your video feed as well. But in the text, as, as Paul's talking about this idea of pain, he tells us that this pain is causing groaning in our world. In fact, he tells us that all of, crea all of creation, all of created things are groaning. He tells us that we are groaning, and he tells us that the Holy Spirit is groaning. Now, we're not going to get to the Holy Spirit this morning. That's going to be for next week. This morning, we're just going to look at these first two ideas, that creation is groaning and that we are are groaning. But before we turn to the scriptures, would you first please join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as people living in a broken world. We see hurt and pain all around us in this life. And all too often, we personally experience that pain in our own lives. Lord, it reminds us of our need for your grace. It stirs in us a longing for Christ's return and for the fullness of redemption. We pray that as we read Paul's letter to the Romans this morning, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the truth of our present reality. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Paul begins this section with what I think is sort of his big idea or his main point, sort of a controlling statement for everything that he will say in the following verses. We're going to begin in verse 18. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Paul says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul begins by talking about this idea of pain or suffering in life. We know that Paul was extremely familiar with extraordinary physical pain. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he goes into some amount of detail in regards to this. He tells us that he had been flogged, he had been stoned, he had been beaten, he'd been shipwrecked, he'd been uh, imprisoned. In fact, for most of his life, he dealt with what he referred to as a thorn in his flesh. Paul was extremely familiar with physical pain, but the reality is for most of us, the most extraordinary pain that we experience in our lives is not physical like Paul's. We don't have public floggings in our country today. Instead, for most of us, the most painful stuff we deal with is mental and emotional 
pain in our lives. And what can sometimes make that even worse is that nobody knows about it. We can go through all kinds of things in our lives and pretend like everything is okay. In fact, our culture often encourages us to be people that no matter what we are dealing with on the inside, that we put on this hard exterior, we pretend like everything is just right and continue to carry on through life. See, when Paul was publicly flogged, people knew about it. And so they're able to go to his aid, nurse his wounds, help him get back to good health. But when we go through stuff, very often people have absolutely no idea. I'm certainly no doctor, but it seems to me pretty evident that we have a serious mental health issue occurring in our world today. There are people in pain, suffering all around us, and very often we have absolutely no idea. You know, in these verses, Paul refers to his readers. He, he, he tells them, he says, our present sufferings. He doesn't say, if we suffer, right? He writes to them with the assumption that they are suffering. Now, probably because he knew what was happening in Rome at that time. But I was struck by this because typically, when I approach people, I do so with the basic understanding that everything in your life must be great, right? We just kind of approach people with that kind of assumption. But here, Paul is assuming that his readers aren't just great, instead that they are dealing with pain and suffering in their lives. Now, this doesn't mean that every day of our lives is absolutely terrible or anything like that. I mean, I I think for most of us, our lives are probably pretty good. But what it does mean is that there are things that happen in this life, in this world, that cause us pain. There is loss that hurts. And from what I have observed, when people go through painful times, it causes us to either turn towards God or to run from Him but suffering certainly has spiritual consequences. And maybe to some extent, we don't know how we would respond until we find ourselves in the moment, but many people, whether we want to admit it or not, hold quite strongly to a view that if I am a good person, if I do enough for my church or for society, if I'm generous enough, that I don't deserve to deal with pain and suffering in my life. And neither do my loved ones who I view as good people, right? And so when something tragic happens in our lives, maybe when somebody close to us dies, maybe a spouse dies or a child dies, or when we find out we have cancer or when our marriage falls apart or when we lose our job at a time that we really need it, we look at the situation and can often have this anger towards God because we question why would he allow something like that to happen to me? I am a good person. And as we carry on that line of thinking, it very often causes people to walk away from their faith. See, it's always easy to believe when things are going just the way that we hoped and that we prayed that they would go in life. It's much more difficult to believe when everything seems to be falling apart. But when Paul was in a time of suffering in his life, instead of turning from God, he ran to God, recognizing that pain and suffering are just part of the present reality of the world that we live in, whether you're a good person or not, whether you're a Christian or not, that things will happen in our lives that cause us pain. But he also tells us it's not all doom and gloom. It's not all bad news. He tells us that there is something on the horizon that is so absolutely incredible that we won't even be able to compare any amount of pain in our lives to what is to come. He tells us that one day, God's glory will be revealed both in us and to us. And when we recognize the fullness of God's glory, it'll be so absolutely incredible that we won't even be able to compare any amount of pain that we might feel in this life to what is to come. And then Paul shifts our focus from this very general idea of pain and suffering to the idea that creation, all of creation, is in a time of suffering. Here's where he continues. This is verse 19. In uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 19, he says, the creation awaits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning 
as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. You may have noticed throughout this passage, Paul continues to use this word present, right? This present time, our present sufferings, indicating to us that this isn't the way that it always was, and this is not the way that it always will be. This is simply the reality of the present time that Paul lived in and that we continue to live in today. But he tells us that in this present time, all of creation, the whole of creation is groaning. Now, when he refers to all of creation, essentially he's referring to all created things, the earth, the animals of the earth, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, essentially everything presumably other than us because he addresses us in the following verses. And so here he's referring to everything that has been created other than us. And he tells us that all of creation is groaning. In fact, he gives us this little bit of a personification of creation that I don't think is too far of a stretch from how we often think about it. It would have been even more common in Paul's lifetime and really throughout the Bible. Right in the Psalms, the psalmist writes about this idea of the the rivers clapping their hands and the hills just singing for joy. And here Paul gives us this personification of creation as he refers to it experiencing labor pains. This last week, as I was working on this message, I was talking about it with my wife, Becca, and as I was telling her about this illustration of labor pains, she stopped me and said, oh, great, so am I going to get to learn from my husband about labor pains? (laughs) Which I understand that never goes over all that well, uh, but I'm going to put this on Paul. It was his illustration. I just have to talk about it because it's here. But the good news this morning is that I can guarantee you I have just as much personal experience with labor pain as Paul did. So I should have a pretty good idea of what he is trying to get at in these verses. Becky used to like a show called Call the Midwife. I don't know how many of you have ever seen it, but it's essentially a show about the role of midwives, women that you know, help, help people give birth throughout history. In fact, I think in every episode, a woman gives birth. Needless to say, I never really got into the show, but... <laughs> Even if I was home at the time when Becca would be watching it, I could be doing something totally different. There was no mistaking when it got to the part of the episode when a woman was giving birth. There was very loud and intense groaning and screaming. Now, uh, certainly there's a lot that I don't know about the pains of labor, but I think we can all agree that this is serious pain. And I think Paul uses this illustration very intentionally Because there's something unique about labor pains as opposed to the other kinds of pains that we might experience in life, right? Because the labor pains, at least the idea behind them, is that they lead to life, right? The idea is that labor pains lead to life. What Paul is communicating here is that creation is experiencing pain as in labor pains because it is a pain that doesn't lead to death. Instead, this is a pain that leads to life. Life And what's really amazing to me about all of this, and I think it's part of what Paul's trying to get at here, is that, well, Beck and I have two kids, Rachel and Luke. Rachel is our oldest one. And I kid you not, only a couple of weeks after having Rachel, Becca tells me she wants to have another one. And I'm thinking, after all that pain, after everything you just went through, I mean, I was still trying to recover, right? And she wants another one, which I think only solidified in my mind the point that I thought I had already understood, which is the joy and the happiness of holding this new little life in our arms was so absolutely incredible that it totally overshadowed the pain that it took to bring this child into the world, which I think is exactly what Paul's trying to get at here, isn't it? When he tells us that the pain of this world, we can't even compare it to what is to come. Now, that in no way belittles the pain of labor. In fact, he tells us the creation is in extreme pain, that it is eager, just like a woman in labor is eager to give birth, the creation is eager for this to be over. See, sometimes when we read this and he talks about creation patiently waiting, we can think of it sort of waiting in line like we're at the grocery store or something in in a very mundane way. But that's not the idea here at all. The idea here is that it is eager, in fact, quite literally, that it's up on its tippy toes with its eyes wide open, excited and eager for what is to come. And the reason, Paul tells us, that creation is so eager, 
is because it has been subjected to frustration. That it is stuck in the bondage of decay. Now Paul tells us that creation didn't choose this. Instead, he was subjected to it, but he isn't clear on who exactly subjected creation to this frustration. Many people read this and attribute that to God. Other people read it and attribute it to Adam or to sin, basically humanity in the world. Largely, the way we understand it is going to depend on how we understand things to have gone in the beginning. When we go back to the beginning of our Bibles in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, what we recognize is that God created He created, there was a place on earth called the Garden of Eden where Adam lived, and he essentially told Adam, rule over, care for my creation. Be a good steward of it. And for this very brief moment, we get this absolutely beautiful picture of all of God's creation functioning in harmony. Right, as we see Adam caring for the garden, and in turn, God is using the earth to care for Adam as we sort of get this picture of fruit and food just bursting forth from the ground, and we get this beautiful picture of everything functioning in harmony, but unfortunately, it's just a glimpse because that's just the first two chapters of our Bibles. By chapter 3, sin enters the world, and God says, now, Adam, everything is going to be different. In fact, instead of this food just bursting forth from the earth, now... You are going to work the ground by the sweat of your brow for the food that you need. And you can almost get this image, right, of Adam there with sort of a a rake or a shovel just beating away at the earth to get what he needs from it. And in return, God says, now the earth will produce thistles and thorns. And we can just, and when you're reading it, you can just see the frustration that Paul describes in Romans chapter 8, this frustration that begins in this moment as the earth is set on the trajectory of decay. Now, interestingly, Paul didn't need a scientist to point this out to him. He recognized it as basic theology, that because of our sin, there is this decay that is going on, that this is the effects of sin on our environment. And I'm sure to some extent he was able to walk around and quite vividly see this. He lived at a much more agricultural time than we live in today when farmers didn't have the heavy machinery that we often use. And so he would have literally seen people out in the fields working the ground by the sweat of their brows. And I'm sure he saw years where there would be droughts when all the earth would give in return is thistles and thorns and weeds. And I'm sure he also recognized how people, even in his lifetime, would fail to take seriously the responsibility that God has given us to be good stewards of what he has entrusted to us. That was true then, and it continues to be true today, where very often we fail to be good stewards of what God entrusts to us. And the idea that the world is in pain and in the state of decay, I think is pretty obvious, right? We see the dramatic weather events. We see the fires, the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the floods, the tsunamis, the volcanoes and earthquakes and droughts. We see these natural disasters that are personified here as this idea of the earth groaning in pain. And I'm sure we also see the destruction we do to the earth, right? If you've ever walked down a beach full of trash, you've seen it. If you've ever walked down along the break wall of Lake Michigan in downtown Milwaukee and seen the trash floating by, You've seen it, right? It is evident. And I don't think I need to spend a whole lot of time developing this idea because Paul makes it sound like it's pretty common sense. In fact, he even uses the phrase, we know. Like, we know that this is happening. And he tells us that creation is eagerly waiting for it to be over. In fact, more specifically, when the children of God will be revealed. Now, you may have noticed there's a lot of sharing going on in these verses. When you go back to the section Brian read last week, we realize that we share in Christ's glory and in his suffering. Here, we learn that the whole of creation shares in the glory of freedom that we have. Paul tells us that all of creation will be freed from this bondage of decay and ushered into glory. His intention is to assure his readers that God's redemptive work involves the full reversal of the curse of sin. And he tells us that this will happen when God's people are fully 
revealed. Now we know that at this time, God's children are partially revealed, right? If we are following Jesus with our lives, we have the Holy Spirit that comes and indwells us, and the Holy Spirit will inevitably bear fruit in our lives. But people only recognize that fruit when they get to know us. From a distance, it's absolutely impossible to tell. For example, if we went and stood on the corner in downtown Milwaukee tomorrow morning and watched people go by, it would be impossible for us to identify who is or is not a child of God. All we see are people hustling to work or their houses or to different places throughout the city. And when we step back and look at the lives of people, we would just see people experiencing all the same kinds of successes and failures, times of sickness and health and challenges and great things throughout life, but it would be impossible for us to identify who the children of God are from a distance. However, Jesus tells us that that's not the way it's always going to be. In fact, in Matthew 13, he tells us that one day his children will be revealed. In fact, that we will shine like the sun. And Paul tells us creation is anxiously awaiting that day. And then he switches our focus from the groaning of creation to the groaning that we experience in our lives. Here's where he continues. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 23. He says, Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We are groaning and looking forward to the redemption of our bodies. With age, I'm increasingly recognizing the need I have for the redemption of my body. In fact, recently I became quite aware of this. And so after about a 20-year sabbatical from exercise, I decided it was time to get back in the game. So I did what people do. I joined a gym, and on my first day back, I did uh, what people do when they're new to the gym. I sort of wandered around looking for something to lift up or move or put somewhere so that I could get healthy. But as my confused wandering around the gym came, I walked past the weightlifting area where there was a guy lifting far more weight than I think anybody needs to lift. But with every movement, he was letting out these ground, uh, loud like grunts and groans, which I found kind of amusing. But he was letting them out for good reason, right? Because the reason we groan is because we are putting in everything we've got. Right? You groan when you put out everything you've got. When you're at the point that you can barely take it anymore, you let out this audible expression of anguish that we call a groan. And Paul tells us that we are groaning because there is something painful happening in us as we are dying to our old selves. In fact, Paul describes this a little bit in his life in chapter 7 of Romans, where he says, I do what I don't want to do, and I do what I I don't want to do, right? He's talking about how this is just this struggle, and as you read it, you can like see the frustration that he's going through as he is dying to his old self. In fact, uh, David goes through something similar that he writes about in the Psalms, Psalm 38, where he says, I am about to fall, and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquities. I am troubled by my sin. Paul and David are open about this struggle, this this groaning in their lives as they long for redemption. And just as they groan, Paul tells us that we groan as we die to our old selves and look forward to the redemption. In fact, he tells us that we are eagerly, that we are eager, just like a woman in labor is eager to give birth, that we are that eager for Christ's return and redemption in this world. I grew up going to Northbrook Church, which is a sister church of Meadowbrook, about a half hour north of here. And I'll never forget, when I was about 10 years old, I was sitting in church, and there was an older gentleman there talking about how he was fully convinced that Jesus would return in his lifetime. Now, I'm pretty sure that every generation since the disciples has believed that they were the last. We look around, we think, how could things get any worse? Jesus must be coming back today, if not tomorrow. But I remember sitting there as a 10-year-old listening to this guy talk, thinking to myself, well, that's great that Jesus is coming back, but hopefully not too soon because I still want to learn how to drive. So if he could wait until after I turned 16, that would be great. 
Oftentimes we think about it like that, don't we? We think, hey, you know, I mean, that's great that Jesus is coming back, but hopefully not too soon because I've got a lot of things I want to experience in life. I want to retire. I got this bucket list of stuff. I want to see who my kids grow up to be. Or maybe, hey, I, I just paid for this really great vacation. I already paid for it. So if you could wait until after, that would be great, right? I mean, oftentimes we sort of think about it like that if we think about it at all. Because there's probably also a reality that for some of us, we might realize, hey, I don't think about Jesus's return on a daily basis. In fact, Maybe you only think about it when you come to church. Otherwise, throughout the week, it's not even a thought that crosses your mind. Which begs the question then, what makes Paul think we're so eager? Like, what is it in these verses that's making Paul so eager? What, what increases our eagerness? And I think there are a couple of things that we see in these verses that makes us increasingly eager. First of all, as our disdain for sin increases, so does our longing for redemption. So when the Holy Spirit indwells us, we begin to recognize sin. We recognize it in our own lives. We recognize it in the world around us. But as sin affects us, I mean, when it, when it really hurts us, it increases our eagerness. Whether it's our sin, our own personal sin that's hurting us, or the sins of others, when it hurts us, we become increasingly eager for God's redemption in this world. Right now, we've got some very tragic examples of this going on in our world. For the last two weeks, every time I've turned on the news, the headline story has been about the shootings down in Texas, which is absolutely heart-wrenching, right? It gives you that sick feeling in your stomach, especially as a parent. It's like you can barely imagine it, and it just it hurts to even think about, right? And as soon as the news is done talking about that, they switch to the story of what's happening in Ukraine, which just adds to this like sadness and your heart breaks even more as we look at the images of people just losing their lives over there. But the reality is this, I've never been to Ukraine. In fact, I don't even know anybody in Ukraine, but I have to imagine the Christians that are there in Ukraine watching the bombs explode all around them, seeing the loss of life right before their eyes, that they have even a heightened eagerness and longing for God's redemption in this world. See, when sin affects us, when it hurts us, whether it's our sin or the sin of other people, it increases our eagerness for Christ's return and redemption. The other thing that I think we see in these verses is that as our knowledge of what to come increases, so does our eagerness for it. And I don't think we spend nearly enough time talking, thinking, or imagining what is to come. Jesus spent quite a bit of time on the subject, and I think for good reason. The more we understand the glory that will be revealed, the more we understand what full redemption looks like in this world, the more we will long for it in our lives. You know, what's interesting to me about this passage is that oftentimes when I talk to people about God's glory, they'll say that, you know, I've seen glimpses of it through creation. For example, I've talked to a lot of people that have said, you know, I climbed on top of a mountain out in Colorado, and I, up on this mountain peak, I looked out, and I saw the other peaks around you in the, the valley and the expanse of the sky, and in that moment, I just got this glimpse of God's glory, right? I mean, this summer, they're talking about the number of people that are just rushing to our national parks just to get in touch with God's creation. The place where I often see God's glory is in the large expanses of water, whether it's on Lake Michigan or out on the ocean, to be able to look out and see the expanse of the sky and the waters, to see the power of the waves, to feel the wind that's so often referred to as the Holy Spirit, to feel that on your face. I look out and you just, I just get these glimpses of God's incredible glory through creation. Now, what's fascinating to me about that is that in this text, we're reminded that creation is in pain, that it is in the state of decay and this awful pain, yet even still, it can't help but reveal to us the incredible glory of God. And the more we get glimpses of God's glory, whether it be through creation or through the study of the scriptures or through the Holy Spirit being active in our lives, the more we get glimpses of his glory, the more we understand what Jesus is talking about when he talks about the life to come, the more we understand that and the more we get glimpses of it, the more that we will long for it 
in our lives. See, often it's easy for us to become very complacent. You know, we'll be going through life just enjoying what life has to offer, and we'll place all our hope in what this world has. We'll hope in retirement. We'll hope in a new car. We'll hope in a new house. We'll hope in the things that we can see. And that's why Paul talks about here the idea of not hoping in what you can see. That's no hope at all, but hoping in life eternal, hoping in the glory of God that will one day be revealed to us. Paul's main point in these verses, I believe, is that suffering, the suffering we experience, can't even be compared to what will be revealed. I began this morning by mentioning that many people find these verses incredibly significant and important for our lives. And I think the reason is because in them, Paul tells us exactly why. He tells us why we are experiencing pain and suffering in our lives. It's because sin is running rampant. There is evil all around us as we eagerly await for God's redemption in this world. And Paul uses this very vivid analogy of childbirth indicating to us that this pain that we are experiencing is one that leads to life. And when God's glory is revealed, we won't even begin to be able to compare our sufferings to it. But I have to imagine, in a group this size, there's probably some of us here that would say, pain? What, what pain? I'm not feeling any pain in my life right now. Maybe things are going great. But I also have to imagine that there are people here that whether I realize it or not, are going through very painful and difficult things in life. And I know that there's nothing worse when you're going through something painful than having somebody like me up here telling you that it's going to be okay. Right, and so recognize that the words we read this morning from the scriptures are the word of God, that he speaks into our lives, that Jesus tells us in Matthew 28 that he is with us to the very end of the age, that he is walking with us, he feels our pain, he knows what we are going through, and he promises one day to bring it to an end when he will bring redemption in your world, and as he tells us in Matthew 13, that we will shine like the noonday sun. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, might that day come. Lord, when we see and feel the pain of this world, we are reminded of our need for your grace and redemption. We pray that in the good times of life, maybe in those times when we are feeling no pain, we pray that we wouldn't just settle for hoping in what we can see in this life instead Might we continue to hope in the day when your glory will be revealed. Lord, might you increase the eagerness in our hearts. And might you make us aware of the reality of the pain that others might be in, even if we don't realize it. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning, we also have the opportunity to partake in communion. I love the way that we do communion at Meadowbrook Church because communion is full of symbolism, right? And at Meadowbrook, we actually get up from our pews and walk forward, which symbolizes that we are walking towards Christ with our lives. And when you arrive at the communion station, we actually take the elements of communion, which is us taking or receiving God's free gift of salvation and grace in our lives. And so this morning, the ushers will come forward. They will dismiss you by rows. And when you um, come to the front, you'll notice there are four communion tables, uh, two on each side. All four are exactly the same. You can go to any one of the four. And when you show up, you'll, you'll see that the cups are stacked, right? There are two cups stacked on top of each other in each slot. Take both cups because on top is the juice and on the bottom is the bread and you want both elements. When you head back to your seats and then when everybody has been served, I will come up and lead us in communion together. Ushers, if you would come forward now.